Today's guest is someone I have wanted to talk to for years. He is a man who in just seven and a half weeks will have his face above us on the Ring of Honor. He has been involved in professional basketball for 50 years as a player, as a coach, and as an executive. 14 years of that was as the NBA's Vice President of Basketball Operations. He was also the number two overall draft pick by Baltimore in 1963. He was the NBA's Executive of the Year in 2002, and as a coach, he helped lead some team with some guy named Dr. J to a title. So, put your hands together, please, and give a warm Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame welcome to Mr. Rod Thorne. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're very welcome. You can take a seat right, right there. Here. Yes, sir. This mic is for you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Thorne, welcome back to Springfield. Well, it's nice to be here. You know, I've been here a lot of times. I used to be on the board, so I was here a couple times a year. And uh, I live in, uh, uh, or I've, I've lived in Ryan, New York, which is about two and a half hours down the road. So I've been up here quite a few times. Well, I want to ask, I want to start by asking the question that I usually finish with. Because this trip to the Hall of Fame for you must feel a little bit different than it has in the past because in seven and a half weeks, um, this Hall of Fame, like it does every year, is going to change forever. And there's going to be new faces and new names enshrined. For the first time, I can say congratulations. And I'm wondering how this moment for you, sitting underneath all of these faces, many of whom you've worked alongside, knowing that in seven weeks you will be one of them. Well, firstly, it's very humbling uh, to uh, be included uh, with uh, this august group. Uh, uh, it, it, it just, you know, any, any, anytime I think about it, it's, uh, number one, I can't believe it. And, and number two, I feel so honored. And as I said, uh, so humbled to be included. I want to go all the way back to your upbringing um, in Princeton, West Virginia. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about the way that, I mean, I think about the history of West Virginia hoops, guys like um, Jerry West, Hot Rod Hundley, yourself, all of whom we'll talk about in a moment. But I'm wondering about the way that that upbringing uniquely positioned you for the life you were going to have. How was, the, how was growing up in the mid-50s in, in that part of the country integral to shaping the Rod Thorne that we would all eventually come to know and love? Well, I, I grew up in a very, very small town, about 7,000 people in the extreme uh, southern portion of West Virginia. Uh, but I grew up in a time when, you know, you've heard the expression of a uh, village, uh, you know, raises a child. And, and that, for those of us who grew up in that area at that time, uh, that was so true. Um, my father was very involved in uh, sports. Uh, he had been a professional uh, baseball player in the St. Louis Cardinals uh, uh, chain. Uh, never made it to the big leagues, but uh, was uh, very involved in sports in, in our little town. And so in the winter, we played basketball. In the summer, we played baseball or ran track, as the case may be. And uh, it was a very idyllic uh, 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 childhood, if you will. Uh, uh, there wasn't a heck of a lot going on in town other than going to school and playing sports. And uh, I feel extremely fortunate uh, to have grown up in such an environment. And it's interesting, when we, when we look out at all the faces who are out here today, many of whom I'm sure would love to take the path that you took, playing major college basketball, playing in the NBA. I mean, that's a dream for that kid growing up in West Virginia. At what point did you recognize that basketball for you and baseball for you was a little bit different? You had the opportunity to go a little farther than some of your classmates, many of your classmates. When did that become obvious to you? Well, um, you know, about my junior year in high school, I started being recruited by a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, major colleges. 
and I, you know, thought that uh, along with my parents, maybe he'll be fortunate enough to get a scholarship. And uh, when when I ended up uh, going to the University of West Virginia after my senior year, I never envisioned, you know, playing professional spo uh, sports other than baseball. I was a better baseball player. Uh, athletically speaking, and uh, I always felt that if I did do anything professionally, it would be as a baseball player. Uh, but as it worked out, um, basketball, uh, you know, became uh, uh, my entree into the professional sports world. And, uh, you know, sometimes, as I'm sure you kids will find out, you know, your heart set on one thing and you end up going in another direction. And that's essentially uh, what happened with me. I'm curious, and, and we think about our, our, our audience right now as well, so many things have changed in the last 15 years or so where so many kids, maybe even as, as young as some of the ones we're sitting in front of now, are specializing in a single sport versus the way that uh, even right up until probably the 90s, people were playing three and four sports all year long, and clearly that helped develop you um, both as a person and as a future Hall of Famer. Is that something that you'd recommend for, 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 for all kids that are listening right now to, in fact, really sort of be willing to experience all, all sports that they want to? Oh, from a personal uh, standpoint, uh, I think it's good for you to play different sports. Uh, not just concentrate on one sport when you're, you know, very, very young. Uh, unfortunately slash fortunately, <laughs> that's not the way it's done today. Right. Uh, uh, those of you uh, will be identified as, as uh, a, a, if you're an athlete in some sport or another by the time you're a freshman in high school, yeah, uh, late grammar school, uh, and that seems to be what, uh, you know, what, what ends up happening. Uh, you concentrate on one sport. Uh, but to me, by playing different sports, uh, number one, uh, you don't get burned out. Uh, number two, uh, as you see with a lot of young baseball players, they have a lot of arm trouble, uh, you know, because that's all they're doing is, is throwing a baseball. Uh, I, I, you know, from my standpoint, as I said, I think it's, you know, to be all around, to have, uh, you know, you meet a lot of people in these different sports, and uh, not many are going to be professional, you know, professional players, but, um, you know, I, I, I think it's very important to, uh, to play as many sports as you can, to do as many activities as you can. So I want to get back to that Mountaineer lineage. I want to talk about that... That run of Hot Rod Hundley, Jerry West, and you in the way that that was, and still is, one of the most special consecutive runs of incredible athletes that any university has ever had in this sport. Can you talk to us a little bit about how powerful the two that came before you were in maybe guiding you to play for your home state, West Virginia? Well. We, we had a run of about 15 or 16 years where uh, West Virginia had, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Rod Hundley, Jerry West, myself, and a player named Ron Williams, mm -hmm. who also played professionally and was a very, very good player. And all of us were from West Virginia. Uh, since then, West Virginia has had some really good teams. and. You know, now they're certainly one of the best teams in the Big 12 Conference. Uh, but they haven't had, you know, quite the success uh, that we had during those days. Uh, most of the top players from West Virginia at that time ended up going to West Virginia. And since then, they've gone to a lot of other schools as well as West Virginia. But those were, the, those were great days. Uh, you know, the sport was very, very big. Uh, in West Virginia, and uh, uh, when I think back on you know on those times, it's only with uh, good memories. And then, of course, the 1963 NBA draft. You were selected number two overall, and I have to imagine that in that single moment, when what had to that point been a childhood dream then becomes a career and a reality. 
everything and nothing changes at the same time because it's still the game that you have grown up playing, and yet now it's a career. Can you take us through your draft day experience and the way maybe you and your family processed it? Well, you know, the, uh, my draft experience is a little bit different than those who were drafted uh, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, in Princeton, West Virginia. Uh, I got a call from a writer from Charleston, West Virginia, uh, that evening telling me I had been drafted by the Baltimore Bullets, uh, who are now the Washington Wizards. And the next day, I got a call from the general manager of the Bullets telling me I had been drafted. You know, now it's a huge <laughs> deal uh, when you watch the draft and you, and you think about uh, how popular the draft is and how popular all the players were. Uh, in those days, it wasn't a, quite as big a deal. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it was, you know, an, an incredible experience to be drafted and to be drafted as high as I was. Uh, uh, never dreamed about anything like that. And... Uh, uh, just, uh, you know, it was just a, just a great experience. I love that story. The journalist beat the, the, the general manager of the team by about 18 hours. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Hot off the presses. <laughs> so then a year later, your, your Baltimore experience was relatively limited. I mean, it was a year later that you were traded to Detroit. Was that, was that a, a was that yet another learning experience? And what was that like? How did you learn that you had been traded and that your career was going to move from where you had started to, uh, to, to the, the center of the country? Well, you know, uh, the, uh, I felt I had a pretty good rookie year. Uh, ended up making the all-rookie team and averaged around 14 points a game that year. And so it came as a shock to me to be traded. I bet. Uh, and uh, during the summer, I uh, was traded to Detroit, and uh, that started an odyssey of, uh, of uh, being traded from Detroit to St. Louis and then being expanded uh, to Seattle. So in my eight-year career, I ended up playing with four teams. <laughs> At what point, because so much of your game and so much of your legacy um, is not only the on-court success, but it's the behind-the-bench success, it's the front office success, it's the um, executive success with the association as the NBA has grown to be the most exciting, the most rapidly growing, the most watched league in North American professional sports history. I believe we can say that without a, a shadow of a doubt. At what point do you realize that, that while playing might be, might be coming to an end, there's a whole new world that you, that, that you can exploit as a coach, as a mentor, as a teacher? When does that become obvious to Rod Thorne? Well, it became obvious to me in my sixth year uh, when I was you know, still a pretty good player. I uh, had a debilitating injury, uh, tore my uh, head two knee operations in four months mm. and was never the same player. So uh, when you're young and you've never been injured and then all of a sudden you're injured, right. uh, your mortality uh, sort of comes to the forefront and you realize that I'm not going to be doing this forever. And that started me thinking about, you know, what am I gonna do when my career's over? And um, my career ended in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I had gone to the, uh, when it ended, I went to the University of Washington. Uh, started out at West Virginia in pre-med. I was in pre-med for two years. Uh, switched over to political science and did not have enough hours to graduate uh, when I, you know, uh, went on to play professionally. So I had promised my mother, who was a school teacher, that I would get my degree, uh, you know, when my career was over. And that promise I was going to fulfill no matter what. <laughs> and ended up doing that. I was all set to go to law school uh, when I got a call from uh, an ex-teammate of mine who was a coach in the American Basketball Association with the New York uh, uh, t uh, nets, and he offered me a job as an assistant coach, 
And I ended up talking to my wife. Uh, she thought I was crazy for considering it because we had a nice lifestyle in Seattle and I was going to go to law school and be a lawyer. And it, our, you know, our lives seemed to be relatively set up. Uh, but I convinced her that I would like to get back in basketball. And now 50 some years later, you know, I'm still in it. So <laughs> whether it was the right thing to do or not, uh, I, I think it turned out pretty well. I think it turned out pretty well. Absolutely. Now, your coaching career um, uh, um, sort of almost rapidly develops into a general manager's career. And, and in 1978, you're named general manager of the Chicago Bulls, where just a handful of years later, um, some some kid from North Carolina uh, whose picture is right behind me named Jordan. I think people might have heard of him. Um, you're integral in the drafting of Michael Jordan in that um, legendary 1984 draft. I have two parts to this question, one that I've been itching to ask you for years and years and years. And so I'm going to start with that. Michael Jordan falls to the Chicago Bulls at number three overall, which means that there were two chances for Michael Jordan to not have played for the Chicago Bulls. So I have to ask you, was there a plan B? Was, th I'm was, sorry. There, was there a plan B? If Michael wasn't there, was... Uh, our, yes, yes, there was a plan B. And our plan B was, uh, of course, Akeem Olajuwon uh, was the first pick in the draft. And everyone would have taken him at that time as the first pick. The second pick uh, was made by Portland and it ended up being a player named Sam Bowie, which left Jordan for us. Uh, we would not have taken Bowie because our doctor said uh, that he was probably going to have problems with a broken leg that he had huh. suffered at the University of Kentucky. We would have taken Sam Perkins, who huh. ended up having a nice NBA career over the course of 15, 16 years, but I would have passed Charles Barkley, <laughs> you know, who ended up being an all-time player. So uh, not only were we fortunate that Michael uh, <laughs> fell to us at number three, but I was very fortunate uh, that I ended up that I would have ended up not drafting Charles Barkley. <laughs> Indeed. What was it about Michael uh, in those young years? We saw, obviously, and, and for, the, for some of the kids who might be too young to remember Michael the Tar Heel, uh, some of them might be too young to remember Michael the Bull as well. Um, but I'm wondering, besides the, the, the winning attitude, the killer instinct that he had, the, the shot that the, 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 he just floated on the floor as a college player, what about him told you that this was... This was going to be a special ride. Well, I wish I were prescient enough to, to say today that I knew he was going to be arguably the greatest player of all time. Uh, but the reality is we were hopeful that he would be a very good player. <laughs> yes. Uh, when we drafted him, um, he played at the University of North Carolina, was an All-American, uh, was obviously a very good player. Uh, but the way he improved once he came to pro ball is, you know, just absolutely incredible. He was not a very good shooter uh, when he came out of college. Uh, he became a very good shooter. But what made Michael special was his competitiveness, uh, his will to win. Uh, he was one of the great athletes ever uh, to come into the NBA. Uh, and he understood basketball. Uh, he understood, he had a great basketball IQ. And fourthly, and something that is not looked at very often, he had so few injuries over the course of his career. I can recall uh, uh, one time, uh, one, during one season, his rookie year, we were playing on Friday and Saturday, and he, he, he sprained his ankle on Friday very badly and the trainer said he would be out for a minimum of two weeks well he played the next night and played mm. over 40 minutes oh. and scored over 30 points oh. uh, he had a, an an infinity an incredible ability to overcome injuries and that's part of the michael jordan legacy is he could play with small hurts and big hurts and uh, uh playing all the minutes that he played and having as few injuries as he had 
you know, really made him not only a special player, but a special, special athlete. He's a marvel. And so are you, of course, Mr. Thorne, which is why I am thrilled now to tell you that I only have two questions left for Mr. Rod Thorne. So <laughs> after this question, I'm going to ask for those of you who have a question for Hall of Famer Rod Thorne to raise your hand and be recognized by one of the great Hoop Hall staffers who will put you in a line to our right, your left, and you can have that opportunity. So from 1986 to 2000, you are, are the NBA's vice president, vice president of basketball operations. By no means, maybe one of the least, maybe the, the, th the most thankless job in, at the league office, and yet you do it for 14 years. Before I ask about what one of the surprising joys was of that tenure, I want to ask, as a man who has overcome so many challenges in your life, what was the most surprising challenge as the VP of basketball operations in those years? Oh, boy, probably, um, as, 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 as I'm sure a lot of you realize, I was in charge of referees. And referees on every level, uh, they're always, there's always a lot of criticism involved with that. And that was a challenge. Uh, <laughs> it was great working with those individuals because they care as much about the game as the players and, and the various executives do, and they work as hard. Uh, but somebody loses every night, and when the games are close, it's always convenient to blame the referees. Uh, so that, that was a challenge. Uh, I can honestly say that working in the NBA uh, was like getting an MBA from, you know, from a college. There were so many uh, skilled, smart people working there that it was, it, it was a challenge every day to go to work and, 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 and attempt to do you know, whatever your job was to the best of your ability. But those 14 and a half years I spent with the uh, NBA uh, were 14 of the, of the best years of my life. Uh, saw my kids grow up uh, while I was there. And uh, the NBA, uh, those were the days of the Celtics and the Lakers. Uh, and I, those games were unbelievably great, those finals games. And it was just, it was just a privilege to be part of that. And it's especially incredible when you think about the boom between 86 and 2000. That was, that was really the birth of the NBA as we know it. The growth, which seemed, just seemed every year we were just watching the league get bigger and bigger in popularity. Was, was that ever talked about in, in, in the front office with, with, with y'all? Was it a matter of being able to control the growth? Because you don't, we, the, the NBA could have grown exponentially if there weren't people in the front offices who were willing to control the growth. Was that ever discussed? Uh, not so much discussed, but uh, just you know, just sort of going with the flow. Yeah. Uh, we obviously had in David Stern, uh, one of the best uh, commissioners in the history of professional sports. Indeed. And he had a vision and our players made that, vis that vision happy. And, and over the course of time, as, as you so aptly point out uh, from around uh, the start of the 80s, early 80s through 2000, uh, the NBA grew exponentially. And uh, we had great, you know, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan and, and, and now LeBron James, all of these great, great players uh, who have come through, you know, the NBA since have, have made it what it is today, which is you know, right up there uh, behind uh, football along with baseball is most popular sports in our country. If you have a question for Rod Thorne, please raise your hand right now. You'll be recognized by one of the great Hoop Hall staffers. What an incredible opportunity to ask a question of a Hall of Famer. Of all the accomplishments and accolades and things you still have to come, I mean, the career is still just chugging along and you're about to be a Hall of Famer. What can you say about the way that basketball has allowed you 
to see the world. This is a special game that, that gives kids across the world this chance. How did it, how did it sort of affect you in that way? And, and, and what can you say about the development of the game since you've been in it? Well, I, I, you know, as we've uh, touched on, uh, during my time in the NBA, the, the, the incredible growth of basketball all around the world, uh, basically starting with the Olympics in 1992, the original dream team, uh, you know, the greatest uh, team ever assembled, started it. Uh, we now have, you know, we have over 100 players from around the world in the NBA. And before that, uh, we had only a handful. So the, the, the growth of the NBA, the growth of basketball all around the world, have basically happened together. And uh, with that, uh, the game has, you know, it just has grown and grown. And, and today, the game is played differently. You know, there's a lot more three-point shooting uh, than we used to have. There's not as much low post play, if you will, as there used to be. But the game is continuing to thrive. The game is continuing to be very, very popular. And hopefully, you know, in 2050, it'll be even more popular. Ladies and gentlemen, Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame, Class of 2018's Rod Thorne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Thorne, I didn't warn you ahead of time, but we have, I guarantee these are the hard questions coming up. So I'm just going to throw that out there and let you know that these have been softballs. The fastballs are on my right here. So come on over. I'm going to, so we'll get it going here. I only have two requests when you ask your question. One is that you introduce yourself to Mr. Thorne, and the second is that you, uh, is, is that you let me hold the mic. Come on over, bud. You're good. All right. I'm Dallas. Dallas? Mm-hmm. Ah, Dallas. Uh, how many rings do you have in total? How many rings? I have one ring from the ABA uh, that when we won the championship my first year with the Nets. I have four Olympic rings. I was the head of the uh, committee that chose the Olympic players. Uh, I have a bunch of watches that uh, Chicago sent me every time they won a championship. Really? Uh, uh, thanking me for drafting uh, Michael. Uh, and I've got uh, a, a couple of finals rings. That's a great question, Dallas. Thank you. A lot of rings. That's a lot of rings. That's a lot of rings. I like the watches idea. Six watches from Chicago. That? It's nice of them. <laughs> Come on over. How are you? It's wonderful to meet you. Just introduce yourself and you can ask your question. Sure. I'm Susie and we've traveled from DC. The hey boys Susie. And I. Yeah. How you doing? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So as you look over like your career, what are your favorite memories from being a player, being a coach, or being like more in the like general manager type? That's a very good question. The difference uh, at the time I was doing whatever I was doing, that's what I liked. As I love being a player, I uh, love being ex uh, an executive in the NBA, and I love being a general manager slash president of a team. The difference when you're a player and when you're a general manager, you're only concerned with your team and as a player with yourself, you know, as well as your team, but you're like in a silo. Uh, what's good for my team? You have feedback every day. It may not be positive because you may lose or you may not play well, but you have feedback, uh, but you're concerned with that team. When you're with the league, you hope everybody does well. Everybody wins. Everybody does well at the gate. Uh, you don't go home with a loss because you don't care who wins, but you just want everybody to do well. So you're thinking more long term as an NBA executive. Uh, than, with your, than when you're with the team. But from my perspective, I, I loved all of them. And uh, okay. uh, uh, j just, it, it's just been a real thrill. Okay. Thank you, Susie. Excellent question. That's a fantastic perspective. I've never thought about it that way. You even got to root for the refs when you're with the league. Think about oh, that. That's a, right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough position to be in. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm good. I'm uh, Jay from Basra, Connecticut. Hey, Jay. How you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Um, uh, just a... Uh, 
thinking about your story, you came from a very small town right. in a you know, very uh, rural state. Yeah. How, how, what advice would you give to someone about being recognized or trying to break into basketball, whether it's even as a player or just opportunities within the game? You know, it, it's so different today. Uh, you know, as we talked briefly, when, when I was growing up, you played different sports. Now, you know, kids t uh, tend to uh, concentrate on, on one or the other. The, you, you went through a high school, and now it's, you know, you're playing uh, ball in the summer where you play two or three games on Saturday, two or three games on Sunday. It's just entirely different. There are many more scouts you know, who are out looking at young kids uh, to see if, uh, you know, if they're prospects than when I grew up. Uh, there, there, there's much more coverage of the sport. There's many more summer programs, you know, where you can go and uh, go to a summer camp and, and play against uh, other kids and learn fundamentals. Uh, it's just so different today. Uh, I think if, you know, if you're good enough, somebody's going to find you. Uh, it, but it's, it's uh, practice, it's, uh, you know, trying to improve your skill level, and, and then hopefully it'll work out. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. All right, here come the hard questions. I promise you, <laughs> here we go. How are you? Hello, I'm Stevie Bennett from Southbury, Connecticut. Hi, Stevie. It is a pleasure to see you in person. Well, just out of curiosity, what did you enjoy more, playing or coaching? Uh, which did I uh, enjoy more, playing or coaching? I love playing uh, when I played, and uh, coaching, I loved that when I did that. So I can't say I enjoyed it. E either one more than the other. Uh, when you're playing, you're younger. Uh, you know, you don't think as much about long-term things as you do when you're coaching. When you're coaching, you're dependent on other people. You better have good players. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but for me, I liked them both. Cool. Thank Stevie, you, Stevie. you have a knack for asking questions. Keep doing that, okay? okay. <laughs> Promise? Okay, good. <laughs> good. I'm Addison from Southbury, Connecticut. Hi. Hi. Um, when you were coaching, did you ever strain your voice? Uh, very good question. Uh, did I ever strain my voice when I was coaching? Uh, constantly. I was, I was one of those coaches that talked loudly and walked up and down the sidelines and talked too much. And uh, my players, I'm sure, would say that. Uh, but I lost my voice several times, uh, which is easy to do when you're trying to, you know, scream over, over a, particularly when you have a loud crowd. When, when I was in Chicago, I coached 30 games one year for the Bulls, and we played in an arena that sound hovered over the floor. And when we had a big crowd, I can still remember playing against Boston, and we had a great crowd, and the game was close, and we had a timeout, and I could not hear myself talk. And so you naturally talk more. Plus, you talk so much that it's very, very difficult to keep your voice. Thank you, Addison. Do you have a coach that you're thinking about when you ask that? No? OK. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have a tandem question. All right. <laughs> We're playing man-to-man -man here. My name is Mia, and my question is, who's your favorite basketball player that you've worked with? That I've worked with? Um, now, I've been fortunate to work with some really good ones. My favorite guy to work with was probably Dr. J, number 32 over here with the Nets. Uh, he was the consummate team player. Uh, he constantly thought about what was good for his other, other teammates uh, other than himself. He was very coachable. You could um, correct him, and he wouldn't take it personally like a lot of guys do. And uh, he was just a consummate professional. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we got the closer warming up. Here he comes. <laughs> How are you, sir? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, I remember you most for being GM of the Nets when I was younger. Right. 
outside of the Jason Kidd trade, what do you think was the most poignant thing you did with the Nets? And part two, if you could do something different, like maybe that three for one trade, or would you do? What would you have done different? Um, outside of Jason Kidd, um, I think the draft we had uh, when we got Jason, uh, we had some good players, but we didn't have enough, and we ended up trading the seventh. Uh, pick in a draft, which turned out to be Eddie Griffin, for Richard Jefferson, Jason Collins, and uh, Armstrong. And uh, Jefferson and Collins uh, turned out to be very good players for us, gave us some added depth. And I think, uh, you know, obviously along with Jason coming to the team, uh, it helped us get to the finals uh, two years in a row. Yep, and, and Jefferson's still playing, by the way, which is... You know, Je Jefferson <laughs> is uh, one of my favorite players ever, Richard Jefferson. Came in the league, was, uh, you know, kind of a laissez-faire type guy, but over the course of time developed into a great teammate and a very, very good player. Uh, made the Olympic team, uh, made the all-star team, and he's, uh, you know, he's played last year. I don't know if he's going to play this year. Uh, but he's had a, a terrific career and, uh, and is a wonderful, wonderful human being. And the one other one I would say is we made a trade for Vince Carter, uh, where, we, where we traded uh, some guys. Uh, we did trade a couple first-round draft picks, but getting Carter sustained us over the course of the next few years. He was a great player. And he still played last year, too. And he's still playing, too, at 40 years old. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, one final round of applause for Mr. Rod Thorne. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was a lot of fun, Mr. Thorne. Thanks, thank you. Now, Mr. Thorne's going to head on over to the autograph table, so I only have two.